Dua Lipa has faced criticism ever since the start of her professional career and I have to admit that it took me a while to really get into her as an artist. However, 2020's Future Nostalgia really proved her to be a major player in the pop world. It is an album full of bangers from Don't Start Now right up to Break My Heart and it was also an era that possessed incredible longevity. The challenge that Lipa and her team had to face with radical optimism was how do you follow up such a successful album? One thing that worked to Lipa's benefit is that she knew what the vision of the album would be right from the very beginning. Radical Optimism is more than just the title of this album. It was the very first thing she noted down in her notebook. A notebook that would stay with her throughout the entire recording process. Radical Optimism is the backbone of this entire album. It's the overall concept. It is the phrase that sums up the lyrical themes and the overall message that Lipa wants to put across with this album. Indeed, listening to the album, the lyrics throughout the songs are coherent. They talk about relationships, yes, but relationships from every single angle. We have the, the joy and the euphoria of a crush and of meeting a new person and, and coming together. We have the messiness of a breakup and we have the envy that you might feel towards a lover's exes or indeed after the breakup the person that they end up moving on to. As well, Lipa worked with a very strong team for this album and you can hear their chemistry come across throughout the album. One notable person on this record is Danny L. Hall who worked with Ollie Alexander on the song Dizzy, which got submitted as the UK's entrant for the Eurovision Song Contest. Perhaps more notably, however, was the presence of Kevin Parker, aka Tame Impala. Funny story, but right at the beginning of Leaper's career, she actually said to her agent that she had this dream that on her third album, she would work with Kevin Parker. You can imagine the disbelief that this would have been met with. However, with the success of Future Nostalgia, here we are. I think it would be fair to assume, after two albums of the kind of upbeat, disco-influenced pop music that Lipa has made, that we'd expect more of the same, perhaps slightly nuanced and slightly different. But then, in the interviews, Lipa began throwing in these strange influences. She was talking about the presence of psychedelic pop, being influenced by trip-hop and Brit-pop. In addition, in one interview she said that the song that she submitted for the Barbie movie, Dance the Night Away, was kind of the end of an era. It was the end of the disco era of her sound, and that now she would be moving forwards into something different. You could say that the opening track of Radical Optimism, called End of an Era, is something of a double entendre, as of course it is the opening track and it is our invitation into the new sound that Radical Optimism gives us. And yet, you'd be hard pressed to really hear these alternative influences within Radical Optimism. The truth is, it does sound like a Dua Lipa album, and you will be incredibly hard pressed to hear the presence of Britpop or trip-hop music, or indeed the psychedelic pop. Unless, of course, said psychedelic pop is simply the presence of Kevin Parker. I feel like there was something a little bit misguided in saying these things in interviews in the run-up to the album. Certainly for me, as a rock fan, although I was already curious what Dua Lipa's follow-up to Future Nostalgia was, hearing this hearing about the presence of these rock and trip-hop influences did have me more intrigued, as I said, as a fan of rock music. And although I wouldn't say that I was underwhelmed by the overall experience of the album, the first couple of tracks did leave me a little bit confused. What I would say the album sounds more akin to, and indeed we can attest a lot of this to the involvement of Danielle Hall, is that of Eurovision. I think it's fair to say that Dua Lipa isn't just big within the UK, that she's also a pretty big star across Europe as well, and indeed does seem to be having quite a good run in America too. There could be some debate 
whether these are true European influences or whether this is kind of Britain's idea of what European music sounds like. However, I think it is fair to say that whatever it is, it is kind of all over this album. We have the kind of Spanish textures on Maria and the funny little flute thing that comes in after the chorus. We have the song French Exit, which does include some interesting passages of Lipa singing in French. And you could argue, actually, that this song is the closest that we get to the kind of trip-hop vibe that Lipa has been talking about in the interviews. But even so, I would say that French Exit is quite a long, long way away from the likes of Blue Lines by Massive Attack or Dummy by Porter's Head. Nevertheless, I think these two tracks are where the Eurovision vibes are most apparent. Although I will also throw in that on End of an Era, which is a good song and a song I like, we have this kind of wrapped, kind of spoken word bridge section, which, when you think about it structurally, is very similar to the spoken word bridge section in Dizzy. Part of me does wonder that naturally with Daniel Hall spending a lot of time working with Oli Alexander on the Eurovision entry, no doubt doing a lot of research into Eurovision music, if some of this did spill over into the Radical Optimism writing sessions, and indeed with Lipa having quite a presence on the European stage, maybe a lot of this was welcomed. One criticism I have heard about this album is actually the timing of it. And there's a part of me that wants to ask whether the majority of this particular criticism has come from our friends over across the pond in America. You see, I understand the argument that this album has only come out two weeks after Taylor Swift put out her Tortured Poets department. However, I want to mention that, at least in this country, the album came out over a bank holiday weekend, the May Day weekend. Now where I live specifically, May Day is quite a big thing with a lot of local events happening on that bank holiday. But I believe that in Europe, May Day is a bit of a thing. And I could be wrong, but I believe it's something that you, you guys in America don't have. I think that the choice of the date was actually very intentional and was overall seen as um, something that could really help the album's success. I actually do want to take a little bit of a step back though, have a bit of a, a grander, a bigger picture kind of view, because I'll be honest, I forget where I read it, but I do recall hearing something or reading something about this idea of albums having the meta narrative. And indeed, this is a fun opportunity to bring up Taylor Swift again. How many people have been poring over the Tortured Poets department, reading all the little riddles and clues that are woven within the lyrics? I've heard some say that these riddles aren't actually that subtle, but regardless, Taylor Swift's music in general is full of Easter eggs, and this particular album seems like one that really invites a lot of interrogation and has a very clear connection to Taylor Swift's own personal life. Likewise, with Cowboy Carter, the recent Beyonce album, there's a very clear, not just sort of story being told, but actually a historical significance to this album. This is an album that is trying to claim back the contributions that black people made to the genre. In fact, I'm gonna throw in a quick personal aside here. I made a TikTok video where, perhaps misguidedly, I referred to country music as a white genre. I'm going to be frank with you guys, I'm not the biggest fan of country music, but I thought that was a fair claim to make, with the biggest artists in the genre being white artists. However, since receiving a few comments on that video saying that actually black artists have always been an integral part of country music. It made me think a little bit more deeply about it. I know, for example, that with rock and roll, it's only recently that we've started to really appreciate black people's contributions, and I think the genre had been whitewashed for quite a long time. It seems to me that the same thing has happened with country music. And forgive me, but this is a tangent that's going on a little bit too long, but you get the overall point that I'm making. Both Taylor Swift and Beyonce have come out with albums that aren't just 
pieces of music. They're these kind of grand statements beyond what the album is. And indeed, both albums, I believe, broke Spotify records when they came out. In comparison, Radical Optimism, despite its lyrical coherency, might come across a little bit small. Indeed, I don't want to belittle Radical Optimism. I think it's a good album, and indeed, it is it is one of the bigger releases on the calendar this year. This is a major pop album by a major pop artist, and that shouldn't be overlooked. But what I do want to kind of put out there is this idea that maybe there's a little bit of a sea change occurring with how we interact with music. And this is something that I would be quite fascinated, frankly, to see develop over the next few years, and whether our listening habits as a culture do evolve. Ultimately, with everything that I've said in this video, I want to bring us to a key, a core question. Was the hard work worth it? I said in the intro that the challenge that Radical Optimism had to overcome was following up Future Nostalgia, an album that had incredible acclaim and longevity. Indeed, I don't think Lipa shirked at this opportunity. You know, she had clearly a vision for this album, and she put together an incredible team. Indeed, on the song Anything For Love, which opens with this kind of spontaneous chat within the studio, we can hear the chemistry that these performers have together, and we can hear that clearly there was a good atmosphere within the room. I don't, for a second, want to make out that Future Nostalgia was somehow this amazing, spontaneous record where everything right first time. And I also don't want to make out that Radical Optimism is this overbaked, too many cooks in the room, you know, mess that simply took too long to come together. But I do feel that with this album, there was an element of paralysis by analysis. Apparently, Lipa had written over 90 songs for this record, and part of me does wonder how much spontaneity is within the final songs. Lipa has mentioned in interviews about constantly going over songs, of rewriting certain, certain sections, really making sure that everything is perfect. But there can come a time where perfection can become, or the quest for, per for perfection can be a little bit overwrought. And I think maybe some of that has come in here. The response to Radical Optimism certainly has been mixed, but it's also not been a disaster. Although not as good as Future Nostalgia, this is still an album worthy of Dua Lipa's name. And with the big things that Lipa has coming up this year, such as the Glastonbury Festival, I don't think that this album is going to hamper her. Lipa is still going to be around for a long time yet. And indeed, there are songs on this album that still prove her worthiness as a singer and as a songwriter. But I definitely think it is fair to say that the rollout of this album was somewhat confused, the world building not quite as on point as it was in Future Nostalgia. And indeed, when the dust settles, as time goes on, and we can look back on this moment in history, we can ask ourselves, or we can ask the question, is music, has music undergone a sea change? And are our listening habits changing? Guys, if you've liked this video, you might want to check out some of my other video essays and discussions, or maybe you'd like to check out some of my original music. Both will be linked here in the end screen. Until then, I hope you stay safe and stay well, and I may well see you in another video.